I'd like to call the uh, Village Board meeting to order. It's March 10th, 2014. This is meeting number 3070. Clerk, would you please call the roll? Present. Kim. Here. Meyer. Here. Semple. Here. Sullivan. Here. Voss. Here. Very good. Would everyone please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, all right welcome everyone spring is upon us wow we made it <laughs> it's a great day today so uh with that we will move on approval of minutes i need a motion for the approval of minutes for february 24th so moved second motion by kim second by voss discussion Clerk, please call the roll. Kim? Yes. Boss? Yes. Tabernacle? Yes. Meyer? Yes. Semple? Present. Sullivan? Yes. Very good. Motion carries. At this point in the evening, we can have public commentary. Does anyone here tonight wish to address the board? Oh, very good. Come on up. Just give us your name to the clerk and uh, go ahead. Your name and address. Uh, my name is Dakota Norton, D A K O T A H. Um, and my address is 132 Racine Place. Um, I'd like to address the board today about the location of the farmer's market here in Mundelein. I've heard that it will be being moved this year. Um, and I would just like to sort of get some more information. I've reached out to Joanne Bednar, who um, is the market manager. Um, and she has provided very little information. I don't think she knows um, too much about the topic yet herself. Um, but I am, I'm excited to have it move because I know last year's spot was not a great environment. It was a wind tunnel. There were multiple vendors who lost their tents. Um, it was hot and there was no visibility, which I think is the primary issue with that spot is that you can't see it from any major roads in Mundelein. Um, so I'm a vendor. My family owns um, Holcomb Hollow. Um, I recognize a few of you um, as our patrons here. Um, and I'd like to maybe just make some suggestions as to where in town I think would be just great uh, spots for it based on conversations I've had with other markets at the Mundelein Market and as well as at the other markets we operate at. Um, Cracklower Park, I feel, is a pretty, uh, is an excellent option. It's right there on 45, people could see it. We could put a big banner up right on the fence along 45. Um, it's near the Park District building, which would offer excellent storage opportunities just for a lot of the ongoing I mean, I know there's a lot of tables and uh, the tents that are used just by the management. Um, there's also the Santa Maria del Popolo parking lot just across the street from Cracklower Park that would just have excellent visibility. I believe that's where, um, just north of where the Boy Scouts do their rummage sale every um, year. And then also the Walgreens parking lot, which is all but abandoned. Um, it's just a huge space that if we were operating in the south, uh, southeast corner of that parking lot, there would still be parking along the strip mall for those businesses there as well as for farmers market businesses and I think that, that that would be even a bigger space than we were using in the year past. Um, so I, I would just, I'd like to get any feedback from the board as to where you think it will be heading and just what sort of options we're facing. Mm -hmm. um, Mike, would you, would you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, sure. Uh, um, the farmers market committees talked about this and you're correct there isn't there hasn't been a, a site chosen although we've presented one for the board's consideration uh, we did look at all of those locations well not the walgreens parking lot because that's private property and it would be difficult we thought felt to get the owner's permission to take up parking for the uh, customers such as they are at that uh, lot but we did look at uh, the Cracklower Park uh, uh, location and the Santa Maria lot, both on 45 and on Seymour. The problem with the lot on 45 is there's no electricity. And as you probably know, there's about five or six vendors that require electricity, and they require electricity for some of the entertainment. Uh, there's also, um, more than likely, we felt there might be rent that we'd have to pay at that lot as well. And the Cracklow Park lot is too small. There is electricity there, 
that's the good side, the good thing. It is visible, uh, although, you know, somewhat set back from 45. But um, the lot itself is not as big and not as easily um, set up for the vendors because it's one way in and one way out of that lot. And the field that we use for Mundelein days, a lot of people think is, is Krakauer Park. It's uh, actually the uh, church property. So where we settled was uh, uh, in front of the new village hall uh, for the, um, in the plaza or around the plaza. Um, it's pretty visible from Holly Street. Uh, there's, um, there's going to be businesses. The village you know, will be in business right in the, in the village hall along with Weston. It's right by the uh, Metro parking lot, so it's very visible from and easily accessible by Metro parking lot users. And then there's businesses in the Sigma uh, building to the south. So that's what we put forward for the board to consider. So is that a firm, there's not a firm consensus on that yet, though? Uh, I don't know. It's still just, being uh, really just talked to John about it and uh, wrote it up for John recently. I don't, maybe that hasn't even passed it on to the board. No? Nope. Mm -hmm. Okay. No. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So that was just we just uh, uh, had talked about that. So we the the committee, the market <coughs> committee thinks that'll be a uh, there's enough room. We looked at the site for the available ease of setting up the vendors, uh, access to electricity, visibility, and uh, where the the other problem with a lot of locations is where do the visitors park? So we thought that spot offered good visitor parking, good vendor, easy for the vendors to get in and out, and uh, a reasonable visibility with good electrical opportunities. Okay, um, thank you. The only other spot that I do have written down I wanted to mention is I know in the Libertyville Farmers Market, they close down a street every Thursday morning and have their market there, and that creates a lot of visibility. And so I was thinking we could um, do keep the location closed down Park Street between 45 and Seymour, and then we would still have that same parking and um, that we've used in the past years, as well as it would keep that familiarity where people know they can keep going to generally the same spot, as well as it would just increase the visibility from 45, which I think um, would be a huge factor. Um, they did look at the, okay, that. Was we did look well. at that. Okay. There's a couple of problems with that uh, plan. One, one was uh, closing the streets, and it's a, it would be a weekly thing. It would be a pretty impactful to businesses, but also the lot not being available isn't available for parking either <laughs> uh, for guests. So it it may look like a lot of space, but when you take that out of the mix, it was um, felt that um, that would probably be the second option, but they thought that going to Village Hall would be the best first option. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else wish to uh, address the board? Oh, go ahead, Mr. Gallus. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Larry Gallis, 2241 Creekwood Drive, Mundelein. Uh, as most of you know, I've just attended the six o'clock meeting and I happen to have taken some notes. <laughs> um, first of all, I wanna thank BDI for doing the work that they've done. Uh, it was a lot of work, they did a lot of focus groups and I wanna uh, commend the board uh, for authorizing the branding initiative in the first place. It's a bold first step and I know there's still a lot of work to go. From a personal standpoint and from what the EDC has been doing with regards to the focus groups that we have attended, um, we've done also a lot of work on that and for what it's worth, we've been drawn to the uh, Mundelein uh, star, the logo star with the, uh, with the Mundelein name on it. We think it's visually attractive. It uh, symbolizes Mundelein as a rising star in Lake County. Uh, I think it's extremely powerful. And uh, in time, it can be very, very adaptable and usable for any of the needs that we have. Um, however, having said that, I also want you to know that the board will stand, the EDC will stand 100% behind whatever initiative you do, because we're the EDC, we're gonna go out and we're gonna try and sell this. And I think we can definitely sell the star, but we'll sell whatever you guys are gonna give us. So we're 100% behind you, and we wanna thank you for your time for, uh, for putting that together. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? So, by, can I just, so I make sure I understand, by the star you mean the top star, not the bottom star? Exactly. Right, right, the bottom star is the beam. That's oh. <laughs> okay. The beam yes. is for growing, star is for powerful, so. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, anyone else?
Okay, we'll close the floor then and move on to presentation and awards. Um, we have a potential development at 407 East Holly Street. This is Exhibit 2. So, someone here to, uh, Victor, you want to introduce them or? Okay, go ahead and uh, give us your name. And you know, uh, it occurs to me, we're like a 20 minute presentation and you'll probably have questions and answers. Did you want to do you your know, ceremony You know, I thought first? of that, it's in the order that I, as you were coming up, I thought, boy, maybe we should have reversed yeah, it. Would got you mind? Family here, no, that'd be great. Let's do that. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Okay. All right, Chief Sashko, would you like to uh, talk about a promotion? Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and uh, members of the board and staff. Uh, earlier this evening, the Board of Fire and Police Commission conducted a uh, special meeting to promote uh, our new lieutenant, Brian Jones. We want to introduce him to the board tonight. Uh, Brian started with our department in 1996 as a paid on-call member and was certified as a paramedic in 1998. Uh, he was hired full-time with the department in 2000. Uh, he's got a bachelor's degree from Southern Illinois University, so we love that for the future of the organization. He's joining here tonight with his wife, Stephanie, and his son, AJ, and Tara, who are in the back of the room. Mom and Dad were here earlier. So we just want to congratulate Brian, and then the, the person that filled in his position is firefighter uh, paramedic Justin Kennedy. Uh, who was also sworn in tonight. So we have completed all of our process with the changes that we've made. So I'd like to welcome Brian to uh, our staff officer position here and uh, just introduce him to the board. So congratulations. All right. Congratulations to Brian Jones, promoted to the rank of lieutenant. Very good. All right, folks, you want to come on up about the uh, 407 East Holly Street. That was nice, but I have to say I was a little disappointed when we walked in. I thought the cake was for us. <laughs> good evening. I'm Larry Pusateri. I'm one of the principals of Bear Green Development. And I'm Chris Pope. I'm the organizer with Lake County United. And we wanted to talk to you about a development that we've been working on in the community and uh, get your uh, reactions and thoughts about it. Uh, Chris is going to talk a little bit about the origins, about how it came to be, and then I'll spend a little more detail. And then we're going to bring up our architects who will show you the design that we're looking at. So I don't know how many of you know, Lake County United is a community organization that's about 10 years old. We're a coalition of 32 member organizations that are mainly congregations across Lake County and some um, nonprofit organizations. Uh, so housing has always been um, an issue that people have been concerned with and kind of rallied around. Um, one of these slides talks about kind of historically what Lake County United has done related to housing and working to get more affordable housing in the budget um, for the county. And then most recently we worked with Mercy Housing to build um, a 70 unit senior building in Grace Lake um, on 120 for seniors and people with disabilities. So our folks said this is great, but we also wanted to try to develop some housing for people that um, are not seniors and our families as well. So um, our team started looking around um, at what properties might be available in, in different municipalities and speaking to mis municipalities um, and um, wound up meeting with Mr. Barrera in your Department of Planning, um, who helped us look at your development plan and identify a potential site over on Holly Street. Um, we were talking with Larry and his company, um, as somebody who could do the development and, and um, brought him in to look and see, you know, if this location might meet our goals. Um, we then, we, part of the, um, application to the state uh, housing department requires a, a nonprofit partner in the deal. So then um, we spoke to Mary Ellen Tomasi at Lake County Residential Development Corporation who agreed to come in and be the nonprofit partner. Um, had a couple conversations with David Northern at the Housing Authority to get their support. 
um, Bear Green was able to get site control working with the owner of the property. We submitted a pre-application and so now we're here to share our ideas and our plans with you to get your feedback on this development, which we think would be a great addition um, and uh, complement to the development that you're doing uh, downtown. And we really appreciated Mr. Barrera um, sort of steering us in that direction because we think it's a really great location both for families and for folks with disabilities because of transportation and access to all of the, the amenities in the area. All right. So uh, Vera Green Development, uh, so we're the developers on the project. Uh, we're a recently founded company, but it's made of principals who've been uh, uh, developers for quite a while between us. Uh, we have 50 years. Um, I started in the development of affordable housing in the late 80s. Um, we've had a number of successes in the affordable housing uh, arena in terms of securing financing for projects, as you can see from the chart. And uh, we are uh, excited to be selected by the com local community members like County United and uh, Sill as uh, potential developers for this project. And, oh, that's backwards. <laughs> there we go. And uh, we'll spend a little more time introducing our various partners that uh, Chris mentioned briefly. So uh, in partnership with us as co-developer is the Lake County Residential Development Corporation. Uh, Lake County Residential Development Corporation has been in the county for over 35 years developing affordable housing. They have a variety of properties. They've been in, uh, in uh, Mundelein since the late 80s, as well as a number of other surrounding communities. And you can see they have a, over a thousand apartments that they've developed in partnership with for-profit developers like ourselves at other sites in the county. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the founding uh, organizations of the whole conception of the project and a continuing uh, partner in uh, the development of the project is the Lake County Center for Independent Living, which is obviously locally based. Um, but is serving the, the whole county. Um, they are going to be, that's a little difficult to read, um, they're going to be our uh, referral source for the disability units. They're also going to be our service source for those units as well. And uh, as you, they are actually about less than a block and a half away from the site, so very conveniently located to what we're trying to do here. You know, I pretty much said this right. <laughs> So that's uh, Lake County United, Chris's organization. They were really the progenitors of the whole conception of you know, trying to address the need for affordable housing in Lake County. Um, they, uh, like, like Chris mentioned, they've already developed the property in Grays Lake. It was very successful for the elderly. Uh, they identified additional need and brought the various partners together to, to develop this project. <coughs> that's some of their uh, member organizations. We sense that Lake County is comprised of. So and uh, the architect for the project are Hooker DeYoung, and I'm going to allow them to spend more time introducing themselves when we get to the plans very shortly. Um, and then Evergreen, <laughs> just one second. <laughs> uh, and then for property management, Veragreen has a sister company called Evergreen Real Estate Services, and that has been around for 15 years. Uh, managing properties, both affordable and market rate. And we have a number of properties in Lake County, but it's all, we also have a lot throughout the greater Chicago area and some in some other states as well. Um, experience with the specifics of the financing compliance and what we're going to be dealing with. I'm going to talk about the financing later. And uh, have a very uh, respected and successful track record in terms of uh, maintaining the property. Sorry, I'm not, obviously not very good at this. Um, Joseph Duffy is the construction company we're going to be working with. Our company's worked with them before on projects, and we found them to be very capable, uh, competent, concerned, and honest contractors who've managed to develop, uh, managed to build projects uh, substantially larger, but also smaller, and including the size of this project. So we're very happy to have them on board and working with us. They're very detailed oriented um, and uh, they have uh, worked with a whole variety of communities in the Chicago areas, and I think you'll, your um, development department here at the city will find them very uh, pleasant to work with. Right. 
Okay, so um, the site we're talking about is 407 East Hawley. Um, we were looking at a variety of sites, not just in Mundelein, um, but throughout the uh, larger community. Um, but uh, we felt that this would be a very attractive site for our purposes, and the reason is um, it's access to the downtown amenities, as Chris mentioned. Um, it's close to public transportation, which is uh, you know essential for people uh, with affordable, uh, in restricted incomes who will then uh, need public transportation to get to their employment and, and other things. Uh, it's accessibility to the Center for Independent Living. You couldn't get any closer without being in their offices. Uh, close to a variety of uh, amenities, as we mentioned, grocery, schools, pharmacies, close to a local park and next door to the post office. Um, we think uh, this project also integrates very well with your redevelopment plan. Um, one of the things that's called for specifically is development of uh, apartment housing within the downtown area to increase density, to increase uh, consumers for your potential retail. Um, and we think that uh, uh, this project really fits quite well with what you're hoping to do and we are glad to be a, a good neighbor of yours in terms of achieving the goals of the community. And now we're into the plan, so I'll call up Eric if he could, he'll talk about uh, specifically what we're looking to build and then uh, we'll uh, have time for your questions afterwards. Good evening, I'm Eric Maring from Hooker Young Architects. Um, as Larry said, um, we'll be the architects for the project. We're based out of um, Muskegon, Michigan. We've got offices in um, Chicago, Detroit, you know, Grand Rapids, and um, one of our specialties is, is projects like this, affordable housing. We've done uh, multiple projects in Michigan and um, we're licensed in 14 states and a um, few uh, projects all over. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you a brief overview of what we've been um, Planning for the site, we work pretty closely with Victor and, and Colleen to uh, make sure that what we're proposing kind of fits within the zoning ordinance and and uh, fits within the vision for what you guys see for the downtown. You got that? Um, as you probably most of you know, this site um, is, is currently developed, and I tried to show on here the kind of the outline of the existing building, which is this area here. So what we're proposing to do is um, keep the building that's on site and kind of build around it and above it. The, the building we're proposing is a three-story building, um, <coughs> pushing it up up close off to Holly and the Anthony. Um, the zoning ordinance has a, a build to zone of 10 to 15 feet. So we're pushing that building, kind of addressing the street right up to the property line you know, moving the parking to the back of the site so it's not visible off of Holly. Um, and get an idea of the three-story portion kind of is an L-shaped in this area. Um, entry off of Anthony, we're kind of showing, you know, talking to, to, to Victor, you know, their, your plans for Anthony. So we're kind of showing how um, our site will still work once you guys um, move forward with, with that reconfiguration. Um, give you a quick sense of the floor plan. Um, it's oriented, this is, uh, Holly is, is right here. So our first floor, you can see that footprint where we're reusing that building. We're putting some of our common program in there, um, offices, laundry facility, storage, and then kind of wrapping it around with the, with the proposed units. And then the second story kind of is, like I said, it was built kind of through the existing building and then um, to the east and west with our common um, elevator, core, stair tower, some common space in here. We've got the elevation. You can kind of see at the bottom of our, uh, with our presentation what we're thinking for the exterior of the building. We're looking at a combination of uh, brick and possibly like a hardy siding with a, um, uh, a pitched roof. Um, really looking at varying the facade, you know, creating really appealing architecture, and then you know, talking to Victor and Colleen, and they really, we really want to focus on creating a nice entrance off of Holly, Holly Street, um, just so there's kind of a front door to the building. So we have have two entrances off, one off of Holly, and then one off the parking. 
the parking lot in the rear. As part of the tax credit application, we are looking um, to get uh, Enterprise Green Community certified. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. It's kind of like the LEED certification, which I'm sure most of you have heard of. It's um, very similar. It's a point-based system. It's got, um, it's got mandatory items, and it's got kind of um, points as well. Um, some of the points that we're looking for, it's, you know, we get points for being close to transportation, um, using water, uh, conserving uh, plumbing fixtures. Um, part of that also is the construction where we're targeting a certain level of um, construction waste being recycled. Um, providing um, for recycling storage inside the building. Um, the, the roofing will be a Energy Star labeled roofing, um, reducing the heat, is heat island effect. Energy Star um, kitchen appliances, light fixtures. And we're also looking for um, to create a smoke-free building as well. Accessibility features where you know we talked about creating enhanced accessibility. Um, we, we will provide for the minimum amount of fully accessible units, but on top of that, all of the units will have many accessible features: accessible appliances, accessible countertops, um, accessible paths throughout the facility. You know, zero barrier entries. Um, and then like, like I said, some of the units will be designed under the fully accessible building code standards. Okay. Thank you, Art. So um, this is our budget for the development. On the left-hand side is the cost, and then the right-hand side is the uh, financing. Um, as you can see, uh, of the $13.5 million, $8.5 million are coming from low-income housing tax credits. That's the driver of about 90% of development in the country right now. And um, it is uh, what we are applying to the state for, um, for financing. Um, and if we are successful, then uh, that will be the lion's share of what we need to raise for development. Uh, otherwise, uh, the costs are pretty standard, uh, acquisition and construction and uh, some contingency for the construction. So we, don't, we can handle any surprises. And soft costs, which is a variety of fees uh, to various lenders. And, the reserves which are sort of securing the future of the project to make sure that uh, there's enough money to handle any uh, things that come up like uh, capital cost items such as you know roofs and boilers and such that break down over time uh, and then the other sources uh, for financing besides the tax credits uh, uh, we're asking the state for several million dollars in, uh, in loans um, we'll have an energy grant from the state and uh, we have the developers participation as well so uh, the, the things that we're kind of looking for from the village are um, we need to confirm that we are in fact zoning compliant with our design and we've been working with your department to make sure that we, uh, we are in fact meeting all the requirements. Um, we need the uh, city to, the village to confirm that we are in fact, our plans are meeting the comprehensive plan goals. Uh, we're looking for a support letter from the mayor and then we want to spend some time talking about potential TIF financing to help the, the development uh, with your staff uh, in more detail in the future. And that's our, our presentation. We're glad to take your questions. Okay. Trustees, questions? Trustee Meyer. Yeah. Were you planning on demolishing the existing building or reusing it? We're actually going to integrate it into our design, so we're going to keep it and build up in it and around it as well. Okay. But we're going to take the safes out. <laughs> Trustee Kim. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Is it a safety concern at all to have um, the families with children so close to a train track? Yeah, so we're going to be uh, having a, um, a, like a tree barrier there. I don't know if you remember the design, but. I'm going to go back to the site plan. 
And we'll also have a play area on the site for them as well, so they will stay away from the train. So not really good at this. You see on the train side, which is uh, you know going diagonal on the left there, we're going to try and keep as much of a natural barrier as possible over there. No, we're not. We're not tax exempt, so we would pay property taxes on the property. So there'd be no negative impact to the fifth district for having this in there either. Well, that's fantastic. And then the, the other question here: illustration shows all kinds of trees around there. Is that just to make your drawing look nice, or you really want to put all those trees up so the project really looks nice? We want to do it both because it'll make the project look nice for the safety barrier that the other trustee mentioned and as a sound imp impediment to the train as well, so it'd be more attractive. We'll also have sound mitigation windows and um, build on the side that is facing the railroad so that there won't be an impact from the noise as well. Oh, thank you. Um, I have a question. I, th I, I agree, I think this looks really nice. Um, will there be any kind of staff living on site or um, being, you, I saw you had offices, will it be off staff during the day? No, um, I mean the staff will be there during the day, not living on site though. So this is really a, an apartment building except it's restricted to people's incomes so that people, um, you know, have to be at 60% of the area median income or below. That's about, I think it's, But that's a, you know, kind of a working class income for a family of uh, five, say, in a three bedroom. That would be a lot of $50,000, $49,000. Yeah. Okay. So that's what makes it different. The other thing that makes it different from any other apartment building is that we're also going to target some of the units, not a majority of them, for people who have disabilities. And those will be um, referrals from that. That was my question because you have people with disabilities. Sometimes they need additional yeah. additional help. Yeah. Well, there'll be um, uh, members of SIL, and those you know because of that they'll have services a service establishment already um, with being part of that organization. They already have their services addressed. Right. And then SIL will. Uh, um, be part of the committee that's evaluating tenants who are appropriate for that independent living environment. So we want to make sure that, you know, we're not setting up people to fail and so right. we'll be pre-selecting people who would be able to live without having a caretaker on a permanent basis. Okay, so that was part of my question. So do you have, you know, how many set aside for fa uh, people with persons with disabilities and families with children and how many? Yeah. So we'll have 12 for people with disabilities, and that mm -hmm. could be families or singles. We expect there'll probably be more singles just from the membership of uh, SIL right now. And then um, the rest is for families uh, who like, you know, have income restrictions, or, uh, income limitations, but otherwise uh, standard family. It, it'd be uh, 10, I'm sorry, it'll be 23 bedrooms and 11, I think I remember right, nine ones, uh, let's go back to the chart. Nine ones. It's okay. Yeah, round they, 10 and They 10 will be paying some form of rent, though. Oh, yeah. Everybody will pay rent in the building. There's a standard rent they'll be paying. And uh, yeah, uh, we'll, you know, we are, we, because of the financing, we as owners are financially responsible for this property for at least 15 years. And uh, we're going to be evaluating people to make sure that it's appropriate for them, that they can afford the rents. Um, it's not going to be free housing. Um, and that that way there'll be good neighbors to their other tenants and they'll promote the success of the building. We don't want to bring in people who really can't afford the rents and that just makes them have another failure experience and makes them a bad neighbor to the other tenants and really, you know, we don't want to risk the other 39 because we put in somebody who was inappropriate. Um, and our property management company has handled uh, thousands of units of affordable housing. We're very experienced at this and prepared for handling uh, whatever comes up in the normal course of operating the property. Thank you. I, I also want to echo 
that I think it's a very attractive building. So I really applaud you. I think you've done a great job of incorporating the desires of our comprehensive plan and zoning in it. Um, you mentioned a play area, though. Yeah. I'm just wondering where that's going to go. I was wondering that too when I said that because I don't see it on the design. Thank you. Right now, like the way that the site is I mean, parking back here, building here, we kind of have a green space up here up a hallway. So right now we kind of have that shown up kind of in the front yard. So and when so you say play area, are you just talking about you're just going to have grass or are you talking about equipment? We're talking about having equipment. Yeah. Having equipment. It'll be fenced in. I think we can look at that. I mean, I think if it's proximity to the train tracks, I think we'd at least want to look at partially. Yeah, probably, a, you know, lot, like an attractive uh, iron fence that, mm -hmm. you know, is really more of a, almost like a psychological barrier. You're not going to go behind it, beyond it. You'd have to climb it. The kids would be able to climb it, but they'd really have to go out of their way to really get out over there. That's a good suggestion. Thanks. Okay. Well, I, I think it's a great idea. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I do, too. I think it's... Uh, very attractive building, and of course, it seems to fit with the architectural theme that the village would like to create in this downtown square area. Victor was very good about keeping we, us, uh, our feet to the fire on that. <laughs> we hope you would find it appropriate and, and affordable to use more hard surface masonry than uh, any other But the question I have how many units, living units, would be in this? In There'll this be 40. 40. Yeah. And what's expected population so be a residents in the room so be 20 um three bedrooms i don't know we get the count here it's around 10 and 10 but there's a slight bit of time yeah, i apologize you probably have it in the, in the information but are you i'm less. sorry are you asking about the makeup of the apartments or what they expect the total population total to population be? Yeah, 40 units and uh, 91 Half of them are approximately nine, nine ones and eleven twos, twenty threes. So we're seeing it as a mix of both families and singles. And all these units you would expect will be uh, rent subsidized. Uh, no, um, I mean they're capital subsidized, meaning they're going to be lower than market rents because we're getting this cheap financing, the tax credits and the loans. And then some of them may be rent subsidized, uh, but we are, we've applied for some rent subsidy for okay. up to a third of them, but we won't know about that for a couple of months. Okay, and the, and the agency subsidizing would be the county housing authority? Yeah, they run it through a different organization um, called the Regional Housing Initiative, which is run by the Metropolitan Planning uh, Commission, uh, which is a, a multi-county organization that is working with the various housing authorities sort of integrate their program um, but the contract will eventually go to the housing authority if we get one for those third of the units so that the funding for that is, is federal as well yeah that will be federal yeah and of course when you look at the south east corner the village needs to acquire property or at least say an easement across that property is not a dedication uh, the organization is that. Yeah, we're glad to participate and give, basically donate that land uh, to the village because, uh, you know, we think that's important that the Holly, that Anthony be uh, adjusted in that way and it's not land that would see central for our development, so we're glad to participate with you in that way. Well, it certainly would provide a much more attractive gateway into uh, I think so too. the developed area than Good uh, yeah. thought, very good project, and Thank you. come to fruition. Anyone else? Um, I have a question about the management. I, I too, mm -hmm. I love the look of it and everything. Uh, on the management, 40 units, and there's no overnight property manager there. And I, I only kind of question that because I know that there's complexes in town that have far fewer units that do have overnight. And it, it's just as convenient to, in the middle of the night to have someone present. Um, is this, a, a, you know, if you want to address that at all or? Uh, no, you have offices there. Yeah, I think we're going through our own experience where we, you know, we don't have a, typically a night manager. For example, we just uh, we're operating right now two properties in Island Lake and Grays Lake that are larger, and we have a similar situation where we have 
you know, management presence during the day. We also have a uh, maintenance presence that can, you know, do a little bit of the off hours, but we're not anticipating. We do do the latest in terms of security hardware um, so that we have uh, camera access on a regular basis to all of the exterior and interior. We would like to just as, you know, we just think that's wise to do, not that we're having any expectations other than any other apartment building. But that also enables us to have uh, additional coverage beyond actually having some physically present overnight. Okay. And so those cameras feed in remotely to? That's right. Okay. So we have a service that's watching that. That's right. Very good. Yeah, go ahead. I, I just had a couple questions. If you uh, uh, got the green light to move forward with this project, when do you expect to break ground? Well, it's uh, state and federal bureaucracy, so um, we hope to break ground around the turn of the year, so we wouldn't even hear about our success or lack of success with the state till June, and then there's a, a whole flurry of paperwork that goes on basically to the end of the year, so January 1 would be our hope start for construction. And then who, who would own the building uh, when it's all done? So that'll be us and uh, Lake County Residential, uh, the nonprofit partner we talked about. We'll own in conjunction with the investors, who are the tax credit investors, who are purchasing these tax credits, the $8.5 million. But we're the managing members between the two of us. They're the limited partner, so they're really kind of have to, by law, to protect the liability, kind of be the silent partner. Um, but they are co-owners with us. We're just the ones who are running it and owning it with them. And then lastly, you had mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that you had this property, um, I don't know what your words were, but under control, or mm -hmm. what does that mean? Oh, we have a purchase option on the property, which if we're successful in securing our financing, we'll exercise that option and purchase it. Is that what you're asking? Yes. Okay. And I didn't mean to be evasive about the investor owner. They just haven't been identified yet. There's a, a lot of potential investors who would be interested in something like this, but nobody gets serious until we've gotten the award of the tax credit from the state. And we'll certainly share that information as soon as, we, as soon as we've identified a partner. And we've worked with a variety of them in the past and know them to be you know, good partners with us. Well, management is everything. Yeah. In an apartment complex. What's the name of the property manager? Evergreen Real Estate Evergreen. Services. And we're glad to take you through any of our facilities uh, if they think that'd be valuable. Um, like as you saw on the slide, we have a 100% compliance record. What that means is uh, because of the government financing, there's uh, all of the various financing entities are doing regular inspections. Um, they're checking our, our, uh, our files. They're taking physical inspections of the property. They're reading our monthly management report because the investor has a huge stake in here, they eight and a half million dollars and because the government has $7 million of loan. So this will be potentially the most watched uh, property uh, in, in the community just because of our financing sources. But even if we didn't have any of those third parties, like I said, we're uh, signing financial, substantial financial guarantees as the owners. We're gonna watch this very closely and not you know, allow anything bad to happen to it because you know, the consequences both to the community and to ourselves. Evergreen Real Estate Services. Services. Yes. And uh, the, you, there's a website if you want to go, but it, really, if anybody's interested, we're glad to take you through some of our other properties. Anyone else? Yes. Yes. What are the next steps from our perspective? Do you need a planning commission? I would think so. Yeah, the next step is to actually make some additional refinements to the site plan, get the letter of support that the developer is looking for to submit his application. Um, start doing some uh, some further staff review, identifying the need for the uh, ident start identifying the actual land for needed for the extension of and the connection of Anthony. Um, we we'll may look at uh, evaluating the TIF assistance, uh, evaluating those numbers. Certainly, at some point, there will be a request to assign two negotiating team members. We'll start working on a redevelopment agreement. Um, there may be a need uh, to attend a Planning and Zoning Commission hearing, uh, one, for uh, a need for a re-subdivision, um, and maybe a, a variance or two, but at this point it's too early on to, to know that part of it, um, but certainly we'll need a trip to the Planning and Zoning Commission for a re-sub. Um, so there's quite a few steps that we need to um, still take before this comes back to the board for formal consideration and approval. Of course, we'll make ourselves available for anything in that process. And are we going to later have a motion to authorize me to do this letter that they need from the board? 
Uh, yes, we will be working on that within within the next week or two. Okay. Okay. Good stuff. Thank you very much. So, so we need, I, I didn't follow that real quickly, sorry. So we need oh. that by the end of the month. Is that something we can still get accomplished? Yes, we can okay. get that accomplished, bring it to the uh, board at their next meeting on March 24th. Okay, um, I've, we've certainly had some discussions with our uh, village attorney, Char Charlie Marino, about certain requests. We've received the draft of the letter that we will be reviewing. So and again, we'll be working uh, through all of that, and I expect to bring that back to the board on the 24th. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate it, and we look forward to being one of your neighbors going forward. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Uh, what we'll do is we have no public hearings tonight. I'll do my mayor's report, and then we'll do the uh, put your hearing after that. Okay. Um, mayor's report, Exhibit Three, in your packet. Uh, describes the change your clock, change your battery week. And uh, uh, we've just changed our clocks, obviously. It's uh, the tougher time to do it when we spring forward. But it is a reminder to us to change the batteries in our smoke detectors. And um, if you're at all like me, the smoke detector always goes off at the worst time. And then you have to hope that you have another one that's working and all that in, in terms of the warning going off. So just a reminder to folks, because I think I saw in the memo, 3,000 people a year die in residential fires, primarily because they don't have working and operating smoke detectors. And we just had a fire last year where the whole family was pretty much saved, right? Because of operating smoke detectors and it's a, it's a very serious thing, so take this moment to, uh, uh, after changing your clocks, go check those batteries out, make sure they're working, or ch change them out, actually. We want to change them completely. All right, and then also, there's a proclamation, Exhibit 4, National Poison Prevention Week. National Poison Prevention Week, and really awareness about this. Um, uh, you, you know, it comes about through stories, and I could just, you know, we have we take it for granted sometimes that people understand um, that you just don't do certain things like go through the medicine cabinet and uh, start pulling off and popping pills from their in other people's prescriptions. Yet you'll get kids that do that stuff, and you have to explain to them not to. And another one, and I just thought of this as, as an awareness little data point. Um, I have six children, and the more children you have, the greater likelihood that something goofy is going to happen. Uh, along these lines, but one of my children went away to college and uh, began working at a fast food place and had to clean the back room one night. Cleaning, gets out some bleach, starts going for it on the floor, scrubbing the floor. That eh, worked okay with still some bleach. Eh, let's try this ammonia over here. Pour the ammonia, starts scrubbing, and then start feeling, feeling a little bit strange. And uh, calls her mom and says, you know, hey, you know, I, this happened to me and I was feeling real bad and just had to get out of there and then my boss got all mad at me and I had no idea. So I said to my wife, you mean you didn't tell this child that, you know, you don't blend bleach and ammonia? Well, why didn't you tell her growing up, you know? So it's an awareness thing. If you haven't told your child that you don't blend bleach and ammonia together, because it can be very, very dangerous and poisonous, uh, please do so. But uh, um, I, I'm sure every household has close calls and that's one of ours. So please keep that in mind in Poison Prevention Week. All right, that concludes the mayor's report. Before we get to trustee reports, we need a motion to recess into a liquor commission meeting. Mm -hmm. Motion by Voss. Second. Second by Kim. Discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Voss? Yes. Kim? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Simple? Yes. Abernathy? Yes. Yes. Motion carries. So now I need a motion to um, open the Liquor Commission meeting. Okay. So moved. Second. Second here. We're switching out our, our scorecards here.
That was motion by Voss, second by Abernathy. Discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Voss? Yes. Abernathy? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Kim? Yes. Meyer? Yes. Semple? Yes. Okay, we're now in session. Clerk, would you please call attendance? Abernathy? Present. Kim? Here. Meyer? Here. Semple? Here. Sullivan? Here. Voss? Here. Okay, we're in session now. We have a, uh, on the agenda for the uh, Liquor Control Commission, we first have approval of minutes from January 13th, Exhibit 1. Do I have a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Motion by Kim. Second. Second by Meyer. Discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Kim? Yes. Meyer? Yes. Abernathy? Yes. Semple? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Voss? Yes. Motion carries. That takes us to exhibit two. This regards a proposed store, Quick Pick, at 635 North Midlothian. The uh, potential proprietors of this store. You guys are here tonight? Yes. Would you like to come up and uh, make a presentation? Just for those watching and those here this references the corner of 176 in midlothian on the southeast corner yeah that's correct. okay uh, my name is sanjay jetwa uh, i'm living in ntr 1125 goldfinch lane for last nine years in lake county uh, he's my partner uh, my name is chitendra hingu i live in uh, wakanda for uh, last two years and i live in uh, Lake County for almost uh, uh, almost nine years. He's a previous owner uh, operator of the PK Paint which was located in the site which closed in 2006. Okay. So basically, we submitted the letters. Uh, we don't have the presentation. The other gentleman. We have it here. Right? Okay. We, well, we have some. Some yeah, I, I submitted some yeah. uh, information about us. Mm -hmm. uh, so we. We purchased this property and we are planning to open up a liquor store says, slash grocery store so people can come, they can buy the liquor, also grocery, and we are planning to have like a, a cell phone store in there also so you can activate prepaid calling card, pay your bill, money gram. So it's not just typical liquor store, we have variety of stuff for customers so they can come and do like one-stop shopping. Uh, since we are the owner and the property owner, we are planning to stay in the village. We invest in community, uh, try to make the property nice. We invested just, we finished with in improving all both units with LED lighting. Uh, we just project they got done yesterday. Uh, so we are planning to stay here a long time. Uh, and the other thing I had, own two gas stations in Tampa for about a year and a half, which I submitted the report from the Tobacco Commission, and I had no ticket for selling to minors or underage. I have two teenagers, one is in Purdue College, and the other one is going to start in UIC. So I know how, you know, I'm also concerned about underage drinking, and we're not here to make money selling underage. We are here to sell, the, sell to the community and be a good citizen. Uh, we can prove that once we get a chance. I uh, used to own a store on uh, 605 North Midlothian Road for 10 years. With I, I just had a tobacco license and and uh, we have a good we had a good track record the 10 years. And uh, I would be the main uh, major running the store for like this new store and uh, that's it yeah okay trustees you have questions mr mayor i'll go yeah go ahead <clears throat> now this the store you said it's going to be a a grocery store with prepaid phone cards and all that it sounds like a, a kind of a mini mart type what would what would you compare your store to be with the old PK pantry? Because PK pantry, you never had a liquor license, did you? No. 
So is this basically going to be a PK pantry, but you want a liquor license? Yes. Yeah. But and we will have a, like a, a less grocery and uh, like a whatever come with the liquor. So back, back when you owned PKs, right. did you ever approach the village about getting a liquor license? Ah uh, yes, that time we did, but uh, that time mayor say there is no. We just say there is nothing available right now. Um, and the reason is, if you drive through Mundelein and check who doesn't have liquor licenses, convenience stores and gas stations, they don't. And and this village has never given a liquor license to a store like yours, like you're proposing. The other challenge I have is the parking lot where you know, the former PKs is. A lot of kids who can't park at Mundelein High School because they're not old enough park there. And I just have a real problem with making it that much easier for the high school kids that are parking, and those will be sophomores that use the lot right there, and they're not supposed to, but they do. And, and they have access uh, you know, to liquor right there um, I, I'm not in favor of this, never have been, and I try to be open-minded. I've been here a long time, and this is one thing I'm, I'm pretty deeply stuck on as far as not permitting. If you were requesting an actual liquor store that was completely separate, separate counters, doors, barrier wall, it's a whole different lease than a convenience center, you know, I. I've always been open to an actual liquor store, but not what you're trying to do. So, uh, let me say something. So, the main plan for us was to open up a liquor store, uh, but then we got the later, there was no available license right now at the point in Mandalayan, so we thought, okay, maybe we can open up a convenience store and then maybe try for the future. But we have a two unit, so we plan to combine I mean, we can go, if we get liquor license, we can go totally liquor. We don't have to add grocery. If, if the law says, you know, if you have liquor, no grocery, that's fine with us. We are willing to do, if we get liquor license, we are ready for that. And also we are talking with our POS developer. So every time there is a sale of liquor, the register is going to prompt you to scan the ID. And our scanner is capable of scanning the whole 50 state ID. So because if people bring the fake ID, they can change the name in the front, but the driver license barcode in the back is very hard to change. So that's going to read the name, address, and the birthday, and the register, whoever is at the register, going to match the front of the license, make sure the name, birthday, and is matching. So that's why we're putting money into those systems so we can track everything. And we won't be keeping any data, we're just validating, make sure the license. The kind of system Target uses. And right. It's, it's top shelf, it's fantastic. Uh, but you, know, you, you have my opinion, so I'll, right, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet. No, I'm, like I say, we are ready, you know, we can go strictly liquor. We don't wear any other in there. If we get liquor license, that's fine with us. We are work either way. We are ready to do, you know. Trustee Voss. Well, you know, when the mayor first talked to me about this, I thought, you know, I agreed with Trustee Semple. It's too close to the high school. There are high schoolers that park there. And then I thought, you know, got CVS right on the corner. This isn't any closer than CVS. And I know you get high schoolers that park over by CVS or over by the church and walk through the CVS parking lot. So this really has to do with management. And I don't really have a problem with issuing a liquor license for that location. But I can tell you that if you have a liquor violation, since you are so close to that high school, you know, I'm gonna be like a, you get one and you're out kind of thing. I am not gonna tolerate underage sales. So let me say something about that. I am ready to do like a one year contract Within one year, if we get any violation, we are willing to close the liquor store, convert to something else. <coughs> I am determined with the system we have and the operator we have, 
and my past record, I had six employees working in two gas stations. We never got any violation, not even for tobacco. And we had the liquor in both gas stations. Anyone else want to? Yeah, Trustee Kim. Yeah, I might just throw a little comment in there. It's true that the CVS across the street does sell alcohol as well. Um, my concern was kind of the um, proximity, but if you have an electronic system and in your history you've never had a single violation, this sounds very helpful to me. Um, my comment is that I'm really glad that there's development in that uh, shopping mall because without, I mean, there wasn't really much going on and you bought two units which are consolidating into one larger one. Yeah, actually there's a three unit, uh, one with a vacuum. She's going to rent and we're going to continue to rent him. So we're going to consolidate the other two units. Maybe. But you are correct, the shopping center is kind of dead. Nothing moving, not just moving going on. You purchased the whole building, correct? Yeah, there's, a three, there's actually two owners in the property. So the first three units we saw the vacuum place, yeah. and there was a fantastic sand and the karate. Those three units, yeah, we purchased them. The other six units is belong to Mr. Michael. Could you maybe do something about the wood paneling on the outside? Or? <laughs> was that? I wasn't kidding. No, I'm just no. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, the outside wood paneling. Would you be updating that too when you? Oh, the one by the bottom. Piece? Um, just outside, like the whole entire strip is all wood pa paneling outside. Would you be working on the exterior as well as the interior? Yes, we are trying to invest in their property to so make it nice. Uh, the other question I had, if there is a financing available from the TIF so we can do the front face lifting of the property, if it's possible. But my future plan is to redo the whole outside, make it look nicer. It's far from the tip, though, isn't it? Yeah, it's not, it's in, the not in the tip. Yeah, it was, this would be the incentive. Oh, the incentive agreement. Okay. We haven't Thank implemented you. it yet, um, but that's what you're discussing is the incentive plan, okay. the incentive program. Excuse me. Well, I, I uh, call back and refer to the trustee Temple's concern that uh, gas stations in Minimark found upon, or, or at least we feel that this is not a location for liquor sales. I think that's because underage customers can come into those areas, buy a loaf of bread, and uh, maybe hide a bottle under their coat on their way out. Um, so I, I hesitate to feel that we should authorize a liquor license for them. Going to be. We wanted to seek a license from the liquor store. And, uh, nothing but uh, mm -hmm. olives and cherries and potato chips. Uh, minimal to, to thinking about that. Uh, the second concern I have is what your competitive environment will be into the future. And we're not thinking of a year or two, we're thinking of you know, permanent location. And you realize you're liable to face across the street in about 70,000 square feet of retail space in the grocery store. A large amount of competition in regard to the sale of beer, wine, and, and alcohol, other alcoholic drinks. And I would hate to see that render your competitive position to the point where you can't succeed any longer. Thinking of the adverse thoughts in regard to many mark, many mark liquor licenses, we have across the street a, a drugstore with a liquor license that was recently granted. So it's, uh, I guess I'm, uh, I could go either way. Wow. Uh, getting the space used and getting, uh, these guys to work. Why so, don't hear from everybody else, I guess. Okay. I'm trying to ascertain I what you're... I think, I think <laughs> that ambivalence is uh, something we've talked about before in regard to okay. little liquor sales. Trustee Abernathy. <clears throat> um, 
I would prefer a, a straight out liquor store. Um, and I can understand where Trusty Semple's coming with a mini mart and gas stations, and I guess that is something, but we have CVS right across the street that has liquor license, that we allow a liquor license to. So um, why, where's the, I guess my problem is, is they're just as in close proximity to the school, so it wouldn't be fair to deny them a liquor license when we're giving one to CVS across the street. So I guess I'd be okay with creating a liquor license. For the convenience store? or the straight liquor store is what I'm kind of. Well, CVS is a glorified convenience store, isn't it? So I guess if that's what they want to do, then I, I, get, I don't understand the difference between allowing CVS and not allowing the convenience store. And I would agree because CVS is, is essentially um, a, a mini mart with drugs and a lot of other amenities. I mean, it's a small little department store with groceries and, and, and alcohol. And, and the only difference that I really see is that CVS is a big corporation who has a lot of weight behind them, which is you know part of why they can get a liquor license versus a business owner who's struggling, you know, who, who's a small business owner, and why we would put them at a disadvantage when we wouldn't put CVS or Walgreens at a disadvantage, I, I don't see the distinction and I don't see that we would deny one and allow the other. CVS keeps their liquor in a far different manner, if I'm not mistaken. Isn't it? Help me out here. No. Walgreens is right on the shelf. Yeah, I CVS, mean, it's right on the shelf. Well, because when they pitched us the liquor license, there were standards that they were going to use different from, so. They have like safety lids on them that have to be removed, but they're on the shelf. They're on the okay. shelf. And, and I think, you know, Trustee Meyer, I think part of, it's not just that they have a big name, being Walgreens or CVS, I think that there was some representation that they would be more secure, that there are um, security, I don't know what these things are, that they could make sure that no one is, you know, that beep, 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 if you walk out with something you haven't paid for, well, I, I that smaller asking. stores wouldn't have, so. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I, I think what was discussed, and I don't know if it ended up there with CVS, is I think the doors where the alcohol is kept in the coolers has a, some type of audible alarm when they're open so that the person up front knows that somebody's in. Now, did it end up there? I, I can't say. Even when you walk through the liquor area at CVS, it beeps alarms yeah. from the staff that there's somebody even approaching the liquor area. And there was some, and that was a concern of the prior board because they're close proximity to the high school. I, I would I mean, just add one other thing. Uh, it would be very hard uh, for staff, if not impossible, to try and distinguish between a packaged liquor store that sells chips, let's say, and a convenience store that sells alcohol. I mean, they're almost indistinguishable, and unless there's been some change in the, uh, I think we all know what that means, but when is, too many bags of chips or peanuts or other things all of a sudden become a convenience store. I think we could work that out. Um, What's the uh, well then how come uh, the other uh, liquor stores in town are liquor stores and not convenience well, stores? Well they just choose that's their business model. <coughs> and I'm not so sure I'm not so sure we can work that out because I think when you give a liquor license, it's a, a packaged liquor license and they would have the same rights as every other packaged liquor license. I don't think we can place conditions on the issuance of a liquor license. We don't have that kind of a category. So I think you either uh, do it or you don't do it. And how do you do it for grocery stores? They have uh, the same type of liquor store, or I mean, same type of liquor license as a, a small package liquor store. It's a class. Uh, 
but they're the same. I mean, a, a grocery store and a convenience store, one's a larger model. But there was discussion about perhaps allowing just a packaged liquor store. And if I walked into a packaged liquor store that exists today, for example, uh, I won't pick on Armanetti's, so let's say Armanetti's. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's DiCarlo's. Uh, I don't know what it's called now. Uh, if I walk in there, they sell a lot of things other than packaged liquor. And so somebody may refer to that as a convenience store. Some may refer to it as a packaged liquor store. No, oh, that's a liquor store. That's a liquor store. <laughs> that's real easy. Well, liquor stores are liquor stores. Um, convenience it's, stores. It's, it's easy until you have to draw that distinction. I, I wouldn't have a problem with either license either way. Convenience store or or, or were to be a liquor store. And I see no reason why they couldn't have it as a convenience store. Well, I mean, you're pretty much opening up the floodgates. If you're going to say, because CVS has, is a convenience store with liquor, um, then we can really, there's no reason to say no to anyone else. And that's, that's how I've sort of felt all I along. I know you've felt that way all along. Uh, and I don't even drink. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a drinker either. Don't like it. But, uh, you know, something like this, I mean. I know, I'm sorry, Ed, I've disappointed you. <laughs> I just don't like the taste of alcohol. Chief, do you have a opinion that you would like us to hear on this? I would say that uh, I don't see the benefit. Proximity to the school does concern me. Uh, and this is slightly different than CVS, is that this is a full liquor store, as opposed to just a beer and wine at CVS. Um, but uh, if you're going to choose between the two, uh, I would prefer it also be a full liquor store. And the purpose why I say that is uh, pick any liquor store, uh, even Carlo. Uh, there really isn't a need. atmosphere is that is such. Uh, for them to walk in to buy a bag of peanuts at that store is somewhat alarming both to the employees but also in the officers that are arriving As opposed to what the business model I saw, which is virtually half and half, half liquor over here, half groceries over here, with two giant coolers with sports drinks and energy drinks and soda pop. Uh, almost somewhat That's my, that's my say on it, and you are right, Mayor, I do think we are somewhat opening the floodgates are starting to crack in too, so really don't think that's the best. Can I ask you a quick question about liquor stores in general? Uh, can people under the age of 21 go into a liquor store to buy a bag of peanuts? Okay, because I remember going into liquor stores to buy Coke when I was younger. I didn't know if there was a difference in age restriction to enter the place. Okay. Well, let me throw this out there. I mean, is there any interest in asking them to redo the arrangement so that the liquor is highly confined? I mean, you're opening it up. I mean, I don't see us having any grounds to say no to anyone else if you, if you elect to do this, because there's a lot of convenience stores. Gas stations will be coming in next. Oh. May I ask yes. the petitioners? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. W what is it that your ideal dream is to do at this place? Did you want a convenience store with liquor, or did you first off want a liquor store, and then you changed it because of the letter you received? The first one was to have the packaged liquor store, but then we heard that there is no available license, so we started, because we already had the contractor sign and money was invested, and we don't want to start construction, so we said, okay, we go ahead and start a convenience store that will have try for the legal license. Okay, so your ideal was a package store. Yeah. Okay. So like I say, we are ready if you just say, okay, pack a liquor store, I'll throw the milk out, bread out, to have the beer and wine and hard liquor. And, and you would 
in a packaged liquor store have a product offering that would be unlikely to attract underage individuals. That is, if an underage individual or someone that looked like they could possibly be underage, that would alert you? Uh, if the, any sales will scan beer or wine is going to prompt the register to scan the ID. So it won't do the process, the register won't open until you scan that ID. So once you scan that ID, I understand to make a purchase. Right. Then you can make a purchase. Would you want to go back to your original intent? Yes. You would go to a straight liquor yeah, store yeah. with no we groceries. Can, no groceries. Yeah. Yeah, we can work both. with the well, village as for requirements. Yeah. I mean, they have chips and beer, I believe, but, you know, there is no, I don't know if they have a milk in there. I'm probably going to walk to a couple of liquor stores and see how they set up. And put in like, you know, like a jazz liquor or the other, the cargo liquor. Same model. Uh, let, let me try it, just uh, maybe say it a different way. Uh, the village board doesn't have the discretion uh, to issue a class B packaged liquor license uh, to these gentlemen with the condition that it be just alcohol. So they can represent today, and I'm not saying that's not what they're going to do, uh, is to have no uh, food items, uh, and they could do that. But uh, their business model could change without any notice to the village, uh, and they could turn that, that into 50% of the floor space be a convenience store, and the other 50% be uh, alcoholic beverages. Um, so it's at their discretion uh, how they do that. The only decision for the board is to create a Class B package liquor license or not. And that's no different than any other store. Correct. Correct. I just I got a little concerned because the board is trying to draw a distinction between full package liquor and a convenience store. That's really not. Uh, it's not within our authority, correct? Right. Yes. Actually, can I ask a question? Is it not within our authority because that's the way our liquor licenses are set up, or is it n could never be within our authority? So, so if we at some point wanted to issue a liquor license at a gas station or a mini market or convenience store, can we set up a separate liquor license for those, or no? You're addressing it to me. Yes. Thank you. I don't have a problem with issuing a liquor license. Anyone else have further comments? Okay, so my count is four yeses, one no, and Trustee Sullivan, did you want to, after reflection? Okay. okay. All right, with that said, you uh, can move forward letter in here that gives you information on what to do beyond this and uh, you know good luck to you okay, okay thank, you. Right. thank you thank you thank you for your time thank you for your make it look nice thank you. Thank you. Thank you. can I make a motion to adjourn this
Yes, Trustee Voss makes a motion to adjourn the Liquor Control Commission. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Abernathy. Discussion? Yeah. Clerk, please call the roll. Yes. 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 Motion carries. So we are adjourned. Now we need a motion to reconvene the Village Board meeting. So move. Motion by Kim. Second. Second by Abernathy. Discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Kim? Yes. Abernathy? Yes. Boss? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Meyer? Yes. Simple? Yes. Motion carries. We are reconvened. Clerk, would you please call the roll? Here. Kim. Here. Sullivan. Here. Semple. Here. Meyer. Here. Abernathy. Present. Very good. Uh, at this point in the village board meeting, we are at the trustee reports. Public Works Committee, Trustee Meyer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, hang on. Okay. All righty. Okay, I have um, two motions tonight under the control valve rehabilitation project, and that would be exhibit PW-1. And the first motion I'd like to make is a motion to authorize the mayor to sign the contract between the village of Mundelein and RMS Utility Services for control valve rehabilitation. Motion by Meyer. Second. Second by Kim. Discussion? Please call the roll. Well, oh, excuse me. Sorry. Jim. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to state that the uh, lower bid was actually half the cost of the other bid, so this is a great deal. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Anyone else? Clerk, please call the roll. Meyer? Yes. Kim? Yes. Abernathy? Yes. Boss? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Simple? Yes. Motion carries. And the second motion that I have for tonight is a motion to authorize a purchase order for an amount not to exceed $66,702 for said work to RMS Utility Services. Motion by Meyer. Second. Second by Kim. Discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Meyer? Yes. Kim? Yes. Simple? Yes. Boss? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Abernathy? Yes. Motion carries. Mr. Boucher, anything else? All right, and that would be it for me tonight. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Mayor. Uh, Finance Committee, Trustee Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This evening we have a motion that uh, we expect in a someone who will abstain from. It is a motion to pay uh, bills to AT&T in the amount of $12,746.74, and I will make that motion. Motion by Sullivan. Second. Second by Abernathy. Discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Yes. Abernathy? Yes. Simple? Yes. Boss? Yes. Kim? Sorry, yes. Meyer. Abstain. Okay. Okay. Motion carries. This evening uh, on our omnibus list of motions, we have a motion to pay our bills. Uh, this totals uh, the total bills to be paid $925,259.84. Uh, some of the uh, larger amounts are uh, one bill to the Joint Action Water Agency, $179,789. Another to the Environmental uh, Protection Agency for our loan was taken out many years ago to upgrade and expand our wastewater treatment plant. This in the amount of $175,391. Uh, you will not see that listed as a uh, motion separate because we approved that payment uh, a month ago or so in conjunction with the one that was due at the time. We also have a payment to uh, the developer of the uh, Mumbling Crossing subdivision, Target and Home Depot. For our tax sales tax rebate agreement, getting close to the end of that, uh, this payment is for one hundred and eighty thousand three hundred and twenty dollars. 
unless anyone has questions. The bill list or other matters of finance. That concludes my <coughs> Thank you. Next, Public Safety Committee, Trustee Semple. Yes, Mr. Mayor, we have two uh, motions on the agenda this evening, both of them pertaining to the police department. Uh, they're both very self-explanatory. Uh, first one is regarding basically a generator solution for uninterrupted power. And then the second one is for an upgrade uh, to the telephone system utilizing IP technology. With that, I'll make the first motion on the agenda, which is a motion to adopt the resolution to waive the formal bid process and authorize the purchase and payment of the uninterrupted power source from D&B Power Associates, Inc. at a cost of $20,870 seen as Exhibit Public Safety-1 in your board packets this evening. Motion, motion by Semple, second by Abernathy. Discussion? Yes, please. Trustee Voss. I was wondering if um, perhaps Chief could explain why we didn't go out to bid, there were two vendors that were contacted and why they were contacted, and we didn't bid this. We met with uh, our provider for our 911 system who recommended that we speak with both of these vendors. Um, there are very limited vendors available for this. In fact, it used to be an option on the state bid, but they removed it because it's so specific in nature as to what it provides. Um, they were both in proximity, closeness to us, and we're able to give us that price, so um, or give us a quote. We actually met with the with the second first the storage storage battery systems was the first vendor we met with and was preferred through uh, Radicom, who's our 911 service provider. Um, but then we sought that second bid from this other company. Uh, they were able to provide a similar system, which was cheaper. So, um, I, if that answers your question. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, clerk, please call the roll. Sample? Yes. Abernathy? Yes. Voss? Yes. Meyer? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Kim? Yes. Motion carries. Second and last motion, Mr. Mayor, is a motion to adopt a resolution waiving the formal bidding procedures for the purchase of a Shortel IP telephony system for the Mundelein Police Department from Black Box Network Services at 851 Bussey Road in Elk Grove Village, Illinois, seen as Exhibit Public Safety-2 in your board packets this evening. Motion by Semple. Second. Second by Sullivan. Discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Semple? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Kim? Yes. Abernathy? Yes. Meyer? Yes. Voss? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Chief Sashko, while we're on police, anything? Uh, you'd like to bring up any reason for an upcoming meeting call? <laughs> Chief Gunther, while we're talking police. All right, Sashko. No, and I just have a couple of announcements, just a reminder for our April 19th blood drive and also to the mayor's point earlier with our proclamation for smoke detectors. Uh, there are uh, units on the market now, they're 10 year battery, they're the life of the detector. So uh, I can just you know notify the general public that those are available in the market now. And then you don't have to go through this litany, but of course we always have the generational cycle. What are those costs? Do you have any idea? Um, they're not that much more expensive. They're only about 10 to $15 more per unit. Hmm. So that is the new standard in the industry now is they're gonna all be, they are all built with the battery built into them. So it's a little bit nicer. And it lasts 10 years, and that's pretty much the life of the detector. And then also a reminder for CO detectors, too. We always focus on smoke detectors, but we're still in that part of the season where that's important. And she Sasha, you said like the newer technology ones, those are the 10 year? Mm -hmm. Correct. So, okay. Correct. Thank you. Okay. All right, moving on, Community and Economic Development Committee, Trustee Voss. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first up, I have uh, a couple of new businesses. Um, first of all, over the weekend, we had the grand opening of RKB Kitchens and Bathrooms. 
had a line out the door in case you didn't make it um, for the uh, people to get signatures of the 85 fairs that were there. But the showroom itself is quite remarkable, and if you haven't made it, they're on, uh, I think it's 216 Terrace Drive, and it's definitely worth the trip. Um, we also have a new furniture store that's opened at 823 South Lake Street, Inversions. Um, and then we have a couple, we have um, something under new management and a medical device manufacturer specializing in reusable laparoscop laparoscopic instruments, which opened to on Tower Road. So, um, as always, we encourage everyone to shop Mundelein when, when you can, especially shop Mundelein first. Um, so, then moving on, as soon as I can get this to open, there we go. Um, we have Amcor Flexibles that um, I have three motions for. So the first motion is to accept <coughs> the Planning and Zoning Commission minutes and findings of fact as seen as CEDC-1, and I'll make that motion. Second. Motion by Boss, second by Sullivan. Discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Boss? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Meyer? Yes. Abernathy? Yes. Kim? Yes. Yes. Motion carries. Okay, next make a motion to accept the Planning and Zoning Commission's recommendations. Motion by Voss. Second. Second by Sullivan. Discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Voss? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Semple? Yes. Meyer? Yes. Kim? Yes. Abernathy? Yes. Motion carries. And finally, I'll make a motion to authorize staff to draft an ordinance granting a variation to section 20.40.030 of the Mundelein Municipal Code to allow a height increase from 35 feet to 60 feet for silos in the M1 General Manufacturing District, District for Amcor Flexibles at 1919 South Butterfield Road. Second. Motion by Voss, second by Sullivan. Discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Voss? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Semple? Yes. Kim? Yes. Abernathy? Yes. Meyer? Yes. Motion carries. Um, and finally, this weekend is the Mondeline Music Invitational. They have different um, groups that come and sing and bands. If you haven't ever been, it's a great community activity. They have people from out of state that come and from within the state that come as well. Thank you. Said, and should I ask how the Mondeline Mayor's Math Cup went yesterday? Oh, the Mayor's Cup Math Challenge uh, was yesterday at Mundelein High School. It was great. We uh, had lots and lots of students there, and we raised over $4,000 from businesses locally here to uh, give out as prizes. And the, the winner uh, at the varsity level was Zach Gleason from Carmel High School, and he's attending U of I and an engineering major. So uh, the whole point is to really foster really, uh, I guess, use it as a way to grow engineers, get more engineers. And, and I explained to the kids, I'm, I'm, you know, you gave me an opportunity. So, but Open -ended. for every engineer that <laughs> yeah. gets, watch this though, for, for every engineer that gets hired by a startup firm, that firm has to hire five other support staff. And so it's vital to our economy to get more and more kids into tech and to get them into those tech fields because that's our future economy is gonna really rely on those folks. So thank you for asking. You're Please very you welcome. All right, and that, that's all I have for community development. <laughs> okay, next, marketing communication. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, there's nothing written down here, um, but as you all know, we had a branding meeting at the Committee of a Whole right before this. Um, Anybody want to say some words on it? No, it was pretty all right. Um, <laughs> John, is there anything coming up or any meetings to call that I should mention? Not, nothing to report at this moment. Okay, and then Lebedo, is there anything? No, no, just that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Trustee Kim. 
Next, we have Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, Trustee Abernathy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have a couple of things this evening. First, we have the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity Grant, which you'll find in your exhibit uh, T and I-1. So my first motion is to authorize the mayor to execute the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunities Grant Award Number 12-203-453 Agreement for improvements to be made at the Mendolphian Road entrance to Mundelein Park and Recreation District's Keith Myoni Community Park. Second. Motion by Abernathy, second by Kim. Discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Oh, oh. Thank you. <laughs> Quick on the draw. Trustee oh, Sullivan. Now, Mendolphian Road is under the jurisdiction of Lake County and we've cooperated with them to provide them a location for their interconnect between this particular signal that's the, we put in and even uh, Winchester and further to the north at Peterson Road in Winchester. Is Lake Dot, Lake County Department of Transportation, going to take over the maintenance requirements? Hmm. Are they the ones that uh, no, will be responsible for yes. it? Their road. Correct. There's a sizable number here for all kinds of engineering, uh, design, as well as engineering. Well, it's complete the design. design. I thought the design was complete. It is for completion of design as well as the construction engineering. Project. No completed design. There's more work on the design engineering? More just a cleanup of the existing, uh, updating cost estimates, things of that nature. One of the concerns of Lake Dot originally was the entrance into the north parking lot was two feet away, from 30, 40 feet away from their right away. We finally agreed on a light in right out as they're leaving as the only access to that is that true? Yes. Very good. Um, there is, I don't see it here perhaps because I don't have my glasses. Is it $70,000 of mm -hmm. engineering that we've, if I remember correctly? That is correct. For a $330,000 project, the design engineering which is Yes, this also includes the construction engineering or the, the phase three. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. And um, I think it says here, and I've forgotten, but how much is estimated that, our, or our grant is 350000 How much of that is the amount of, what percentage of the total project do we think that'll be? At this point, probably about about 85, 80, 85 percent of it. The park district is pledged twenty-eight thousand. It's pledged twenty-eight. Now going back a while, I think Pulte built the subdivision across the road. Yes. Is there not an amount? Provided in us, yeah. uh, escrowed. Yes, there was a improvement. Yeah, there was a small amount at the time that that was contemplated. Gosh, I don't know, eight years seems like a long time ago, maybe longer. Um, there was twenty thousand dollars that they had uh, provided the village for a pedestrian cro crosswalk. So that's available. Yeah, that oh. money would be used for this project. So this is a funded project. This one. Best we can tell with engineers, yes. with engineers' estimates. Now we won't know for sure until we go to bid. Okay, very good. But we're close. Thank we're you. We're close. All right. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. I rest. <laughs> Anyone else? No. Okay, clerk, please call the roll. Abernathy. Yes. Kim. Yes. Voss. Yes. Yeah. Meyer. Yes. Sullivan. Yes. Semple. Yes. Motion carries. 
Okay, then I also have a motion to approve an engineering services agreement in the amount of $70,689.20 to Hampton, Lenzini, and Renwick, Inc., and authorize their Director of Public Works and Engineering to sign the agreement. Second the motion. Motion by Abernathy, second by Semple. Discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Abernathy? Yes. Semple? Yes. Kim? Yes. Meyer? Yes. Yes. Fox. Yes. Motion carries. Okay, then also we have something for the Chicago Avenue extension and facility <coughs> driveway improvements to go out to bid. Um, a motion to approve a resolution authorizing the execution of a contract between the Village of Mundelein and Chicago Land Paving for the Chicago Avenue extension and driveway improvement projects. Motion, motion by Abernathy, second by Semple. Discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Abernathy? Yes. Semple? Yes. Kim? Yes. Meyer? Yes. Boss? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, and then a motion to authorize a purchase over, a purchase over, purchase order. <laughs> Sorry, I said purchase over, purchase order for an amount not to exceed $275,415.50 for said project to Chicagoland Paving, Inc. Second the motion. Motion by Abernathy, second by Semple. Discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Abernathy? Yes. Semple? Yes. Meyer? Yes. Kim? Yes. Boss? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Motion carries. That is all I have for you tonight. Uh, Mr. Boucher, anything? Nope. Very good. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, other reports? Does the trustee have any other reports, items to bring up? No? Okay. Very good. Let's go to the scheduled business. Omnibus vote items. We have exhibit, or excuse me, we have items A, B, C, D, and E. Does any trustee wish to pull one or more of the items off the omnibus vote list? A, please, Mr. Mayor. I'm sorry? A? A? Yes. A is an apple. Okay. B, please. B? Yes. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, so I need a motion to pass items C, D, and E on the omnibus vote items. So moved. Motion by Kim, second by Voss. Discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Kim? Yes. Voss? Yes. Meyer? Yes. Abernathy? Yes. Semple? Yes. Yes. Motion carries. That takes us to item A, Trustee Kim. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to clarify that the two changes are, it's just, um, it's a con inconsistency error from, that was carried over. Uh, it's not an actual changing of zones, because I know it was published in all the newspapers and everything, but there is no actual zone changing. It was just um, some carried over, like for example, um, see if I can find it, but the, the uh, school slash institute area Yeah, it's, the school didn't carry over to the correct zone, and so we're changing that. That is correct. We're not we're not doing any rezoning of any of any sort. We're just cleaning up errors that we made that were made in the last core round. Okay. So again, we're not intending to rezone it, any properties. This is just a cleanup matter. Okay, that was my understanding, but I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Would you like to make a motion to pass a? Yes, I will. Um, motion to pass an ordinance granting approval of the official zoning map for the village of Mundelein, Illinois. Thanks. Motion by Kim, second by Abernathy. Discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Kim? Yes. Abernathy? Yes. Meyer? Yes. Semple? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Voss? Yes. Motion carries. That takes us to item B, Trustee Voss. Item B is a motion authorizing the village administrator's signature on an application for the Planning and Zoning Commission and the village board to consider a text amendment to the zoning ordinance. I thought perhaps we might want to explain who the um, village administrator is petitioning. Why, why are we doing this? We make, we make changes to ordinances all the time. We don't generally petition ourselves. Yeah. 
that's a good question. Uh, what this relates to is that uh, any time, uh, this goes back to our discussion with uh, the board's discussion at the committee, the whole meeting regarding the, uh, 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 the changes uh, that are coming with the uh, uh, sale of cannabis and the growing of cannabis. And um, uh, the board passed a resolution that uh, said that the plan commission would consider uh, where this would be appropriate use to do both of those things. And so to do that, uh, we currently don't provide for the growing of cannabis or the sale of cannabis because it's illegal. And so therefore, it's not in our zoning ordinance. And as a result, um, the plan commission has to consider a text amendment to the zoning ordinance that would provide an appropriate zoning for both of those activities. And so, uh, uh, there has to be a petition uh, that goes before the Planning Commission because it will be a public hearing. And so the board's action tonight is authorizing me to sign that petition for the uh, petition to go forward and conduct the, the Planning Commission, Planning and Zoning Commission to conduct the public hearing on that matter, uh, to make a recommendation, to come back to the board uh, with their findings. So, that's what the board is doing. So any time that we want to consider a zoning change, we would have to ask you? Yes. You can authorize myself, authorize the mayor. It would be the appropriate action to file a petition. Otherwise, um, and uh, um, anybody can actually file a petition to uh, make a text amendment to our zoning ordinance. Uh, residents can, uh, anybody can make that. In this instance, it's the village board, so there has to be a signature on that application. Hmm. I guess I just, in my tenure on the board, I don't ever remember us doing the request. That. The request that we're making this evening is no different from the request that we made last year when we went through a series of amendments uh, shortly after the adoption of the of the zoning code. Um, so, you know, we're just we're following that same process and actually. The request that we're making this evening will also be the request that we'll be making in a couple of weeks from now, um, authorizing uh, signature on yet another application for another series of amendments that we're working on to the zoning code. Okay. All right. Well, then I guess I'll make a motion to authorize the village administrator's signature on an application for the Planning and Zoning Commission and the Village Board to consider text amendments to the zoning ordinance regarding cannabis cultivation centers and distribution facilities. Second. Motion by Voss, second by Abernathy. Discussion? Good question. Trustee Kim. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Victor, does giving um, giving the authorization to the village administrator streamline a process versus what we would have normally done? Um, it doesn't. It doesn't. It just formalizes the process and it puts the village in the same situation as any other applicant. So all you're doing here is just um, acknowledging the fact that here the village is the one requesting this change and we're taking it through the process as we would any other applicant. So when this goes before the plan commission, do we appear? I no, mean, but, but they, 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 that's a good point. I was just thinking there could be a uh, possibility that uh, Chief Gunther would uh, possibly be in attendance because there may be questions from the plan commission as it relates to some of the law enforcement things. Uh, I know that the planning staff has been involved in the countywide um, meetings uh, to do that, so uh, we could be called upon to, um, you know, expert witness, if you know, but at least to give testimony during the public hearing process uh, that the Planning Commission. Uh, the Planning Commission could, quite frankly, uh, request uh, some other expert uh, show up. Um, I'm just not sure, but uh, we're going to get public comment during that uh, public hearing period. I'll do that just as if we were a developer making a petition uh, before the planning, planning zone. Okay. All right. Please call the roll. Yes. Abernathy? Yes. Yes. Simple? Yes. Meyer? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Okay. That takes us to village staff reports. Village Administrator, Mr. Lobato. Uh, I have uh, no report. Uh, there is one item under my uh, report that I'm going to defer to Mr. Flynn, 
Uh, and, uh, but before I do that, I just want to comment. Uh, it reminded me when I saw under finance the AT&T bill, uh, uh, Trustee Sullivan had requested that we uh, uh, dig into our phone bills a little bit and provide a report to the board. And, and so we're still working on that. So uh, other than that, I will refer the next item to uh, Mr. Flynn. Thank you, John. Uh, just distributed the uh, bid results from this afternoon's bid for the electrical aggregation. If you recall, two weeks ago, we authorized uh, NIMAC, to, NIMAC to conduct the bid. The bids came in today. They were significantly higher than what we had expected. So David Hoover is in the audience um, to explain the bid, uh, the bids that we received today. And uh, we uh, do, the bids are, uh, uh, we had hoped the bids would come in in the six, the higher, mid to high six range. They came in over seven, as you can see. So David can explain uh, that uh, though we will be making a motion or asking for a motion to remove this item from uh, the uh, uh, agenda and uh, uh, rebid the. Uh, bids for uh, aggregation and return them return to the board at the next uh, board meeting. Uh, so uh, David can kind of let you know the background of what happened here uh, or, or what uh, the bid results were. Um, if, I'm, if I might, uh, uh, just a quick overview of the program, uh, the aggregation program for the residents uh, that you all put in place for the last 18 months um, has been a success. Um, uh, you have saved the residents approximately $275 that they would otherwise have paid to come in. And that's about $2.5 million that you kept here in the community as opposed to sending to come in. So uh, our hats off to you all for you know, taking the initiative to, do, to put this program and to help the residents. We are coming up on the renewal. And, uh, um, and so there's some unusual things that you see before you uh, as far as the pricing is concerned. Uh, the first uh, when you see this pricing, the first thing you may ask yourself is, well, how do we compare it to the ComEd rate? Because, let me just be clear, you have the option at the expiration of your program to put your program on suspense for a year and to roll everybody back to Commonwealth Medicine. That is an option available to you. Unfortunately, we have a little timing issue here because you need to make your decision before the ComEd rate comes out. So I know that's a little uh, backwards, but that's just the way the timing has come out to date. ComEd will release their rates uh, at the end of May for the June 1 cycle. They release their rates a year at a time from June to May 31st. Um, so we won't know those. So there's two possibilities in how you go to bid with the suppliers. We've asked them for a guarantee or some sort of assurance that you would, that your rate will always be lower than ComEd or that you have the opportunity to suspend the program if it ever become the case. Um, with the narrowing in the prices from where we've been in the past, suppliers are hesitant to do that. So as a result, uh, if you look over in the third column from the left, you'll see rate guarantee. Um, you'll see that the one supplier for energy is the only one who gives us a guarantee. Let me just stipulate that the guarantee is essentially, it's not a guarantee, it's an escape clause, and it empowers you as the aggregator of the municipality, should you, should the rates drop down underneath the kind of rates in the future, uh, you have the option to pull the plug and at that time remove every, and return everybody back to combat. So, in other words, let me give you an example. If you, if the, if you were to elect the, the first energy rate of 7.4 cents, um, and give you a hypothetical example, let's just assume that in June, kind of sets the rate at eight cents. So you say, that's fine, we're saving everybody money. If they reset the rate again in year two at eight cents, that's fine, you're saving everybody money, your rate's still attractive. If in year three, they tend to set the rate at four cents, all of a sudden you're at 7.4 cents, you're underwater. Um, with that guarantee or that escape clause, you as the aggregator for the entire community could say, oh, wait a minute, that trip. So you could then declare uh, 
put the uh, notice to the supplier and you could send everybody in the community back to the lower con ed rate. So that's a nice feature to have. That protects you all and make sure that the residents are um, able to um, always enjoy the lower of the two. That's the good news. The bad news is they're the only ones currently offering that rate. So if I can, let me just draw one more distinction and we'll open up for questions. I'm sure that you've heard me talking enough here. But so let's just to draw the distinction between, you'll see here just in the, the marketplace, uh, the three year rate is the most attractive rate at the time. Uh, by the way, on the constellation rate, the three year rate 7037, just a point, if you elected that rate, the residents would pay 7037 all 36 months of the contract. It is not a step down. They pay the first rate, one rate, then it's, a, it's the flat rate for the entire 36 months of the contract. So let me just compare the two. If you looked at the constellation rate of 7037 versus the first energy rate of 7.4, at first blush you say, oh, the constellation is a better rate. But we don't know where the ComEd rate is going to come out over the next three years. And in the option with constellation is you, as the aggregation, would be committed to that rate or the duration um, if you select the 7037. So just to be clear, if ComEd in year three again sets the rate at five cents um, and uh, your rate is now higher than the ComEd rate, um, the residents individually had the option of leaving with no penalty, no charges, no early termination fees, you could publish it in a newsletter if you wanted to. You could say, hey, we did the very best we could. We saved you money for four years in a row now, but you know, this last year, we're not saving you money. You have the option individually to move back to Commonwealth Edison. That would be available in, in a non-guaranteed rate option. Just to draw the distinction, if you were to select the first energy rate with a guarantee, you could go along um, if the 7.4 cent rate were higher, than, or lower than the ComEd rate for a year or for two, and in year three, the rate ComEd sets the rate at five cents. At that particular time, since you have the option, you could say, oh, you, as a, you could put the notice to the supplier, and you, as the aggregator, can unilaterally move everybody in the aggregation back to the lower Commonwealth Edison rate. So that's the main distinction that you'll see in that rate guarantee option and what that is. And that, can be an attractive feature. Unfortunately, the trade-off you're going to see is, is to have that option, there's a little bit of a cost premium to that. So, can I just ask, this year, like, ComEd rates are between 7 and 7 and cents? We're estimating that's where we think the ComEd rate may end up in June when they set the rate. That's our estimate. And what, what are they currently? Current, uh, currently 6. And your rate is currently 4.77. So your so current. This is a huge increase. It is. Um, okay. And then on this um, handout that I assume you know that we're looking at, it says customer service and it has these stars. Could you tell me? Some of them are five, some of them are four, and some of them are three. Is it better to have more or fewer? Better to have more. Okay. These are ratings that the ICC puts out. Um, so we, we publish those for you so that you have a sense of the carriers. Um, they relate to the number of complaints that the ICC receives uh, across the board. Um, we can give that to you, but we also will tell you that um, if we have any reservations about them doing their job, we wouldn't put them on here. So. <coughs> And um, lastly, sorry, if we rebid this, or we're rebidding it to the same companies, why do you expect to be different? Um, <coughs> these rates we've been bidding, we bid last week. Um, we bid some communities nearby with some pretty attractive rates. Um, these came in higher. Um, I don't know if it was the marketplace, um, but I my recommendation is to wait two weeks and see if the marketplace settles down a little bit. These rates are higher than what we've been seeing over the last week or two. Okay, thank you. Early termination. They may, but just to the point, they may come back higher. So yeah. early termination fee. Does that mean the individual could opt out of the plan if they want? 
That is correct. All the plans going forward have no early termination fees. So at any time, any resident gets a better offer, likes the ComEd rate, doesn't like the color of the bill from your supplier, they can leave. Okay, so it's not that, like you said, with the rate uh, guarantee option, with First Energy, say they give us a rate guarantee that it could, that ComEd's gonna be lower. If I, as John Smith at this home, we have, we go with First Energy and say we say we pick Constellation, okay, at 7037. But I said, it comes out, ComEd's is six and a half. So I, as a person, can say, I don't wanna do this. You, as a resident, can at any time on any of these plans leave at any time for any reason for no fee. Okay. The the guarantee, I was confused, the guarantee we're talking about applies to you, the okay. municipality, as the aggregator to unilaterally move everybody if you feel it came in their best interest. It gives you more flexibility. It's nice to have. I wish the rates were the same. It'd be a pretty easy one to take. Yeah. Um, so my hope is in a couple of weeks we you know come back and unfortunately the reason I'm drawing this out is I don't think I'll be able to be here in, in two weeks, um, but you're going to see numbers pretty similar. So I wanted to force the conversation while I'm here, um, and I'll have a conversation with Mike that afternoon when the rates come in. Um, but the the choice will be to continue the program or put it on suspense. Um, and if you continue the program. How valuable is the guarantee to yourself? So let me just give you a, an example of a, some nearby communities that just renewed theirs. They took a option similar to Constellation. It wasn't quite as high as seven. It was in the mid sixes. And their view was, we'll save our residents. Um, let me just say, the guaranteed rate was a couple tenths of a cent higher. And so these commu this community said, we'll take the constellation rate. We know we're locked into it for all three years, but they felt that the savings would more than warrant that. And they had the guarantee, they had the option for the resident, if it was reset in year three, um, that they would inform the residents that we did the best we could. You're free to make a 30 second phone call. No. A couple minute phone call to come down. <laughs> I, I, I retract that. And to say, um, you know, please move me back. So um, again, my plan is to have new rates, a new rate sheet identical to this with updated numbers. We'll hope that the rates drop off. We'll certainly hope that the, um, the first energy rate drops. Let me just suggest that I consider it a, a high premium uh, at first energy with the rate guarantee. What that just does, um, I don't know what the comment rate will be when they set it in um, June of this year. They may set it at 6.9, and if that's the case, I don't want to lock you into a rate higher. So the just so I understand that the the guarantee gives you all maximum flexibility. That even if you enter into a program today, and even before the program starts in July, if the ComEd rate comes out and it's set unusually low, either in month one or in month 27, you have the opportunity to waive the white flag and return everybody to come with us. Yeah, um, since the rates are set in June, we, we seem to be like off cycle where we're mm -hmm. forced into doing it yeah. before. Is there any way to somehow get it where we have to make this decision after um, ComEd sets our rates? Uh, we so don't have that option presently, but um, if you all choose to suspend the program for a year, then we would have that option again next year uh, when, when, when it comes back up. Because the, the rules state that once you come back to ComEd, you being any ComEd account holder, residential or commercial, when you come back to Commonwealth Edison, you basically have to stay there for a year. And you can't like get a couple month extension on We the tried those prices and they were um, prohibitive. Because it seems like we're always gonna be behind the eight ball going forward every single year with that same type of speculation. The, the problem, yes, so you would like to know, so you would like to go to bid in June once you have the comment rate set in the NMA. I appreciate that. Unfortunately, 
ComEd for the first time now has the right to come in and reset the rate again in September. So they just went to the ICC and said there's so many changes going on. We'll set a rate, but we reserve the right to reset it again. In addition to that, there is a monthly, I'll call it a true up, it's, a, it's an adjustment that is added to a residence bill who gets their power from Commonwealth Edison. That can swing a half a cent positive, half a cent negative. All that to say, I, the good old days were, tell me what the comment rate is, can we beat it? The comment rate is now, in the future, more like that. So that's why, again, the premium I appreciate is, if you have the guarantee, we'll track it for you on an ongoing basis, you know, against this moving target, and you have the flexibility to say yay or nay. And, and I really appreciate that explanation because that helps make it more sense that it's not a fixed all year round. Yeah, it used but to be, it used to be, and it was great, uh, but unfortunately the more, <laughs> the more we get into, the first time we did this two years ago, it was a no-brainer, and we just, it was a home run. You guys did a great job for your residents. Now it gets to be, you know, a little bit more. But the second component that you've brought up in your clarification <coughs> says that, you know, if the comrade, comrade, Commonwealth Edison rates are lower, and we do suspend, even in that year suspension, if you're saying it's like a roller coaster, y you may have some months that might be good and some months that might be bad based under how you're portraying it now. Well, see, here's the, yeah, that's correct. And here's the irony is that, let's say you do this and you lock into a rate and then it's attractive for the first year, just give you a hypothetical, let's assume that next June they set a rate and let's say it's lower than your rate. So you say, okay, let's go back. Well, then you go back, and then kind of resets the rate in the fall, and maybe it's higher. But now you're locked in for 12 months. <laughs> so it's, it's, um, it's unfortunately, it, it's, it, it was nice when it was a real clear line in the sand with kind of rate. We just saved you money in the past, but we knew we couldn't guarantee the best, so we always have an open door policy. You're free to leave, no charge, no early charge fee. I have two questions. First, uh, we're gonna, you know, once rates go up, we'll be asked by residents why in the world did they go up so much. Yeah. So can you explain maybe sure. from a macroeconomic perspective why this is happening? Yeah, so there's two main reasons that go into this. One is, um, one is there is a, uh, a regulated charge um, that, not a ComEd rate, but it's a regulated transmission charge that is embedded in these power rates that will go up at least a penny um, come June 1st. So we expect the ComEd rate to basically go from six cents to at least seven cents just because of that one transmission charge. Is that a tax? What, where's that from? That's it is a it is a regulated charge um, paid to, that money goes to the suppliers, the generators, excuse me, to ensure that there is ample capacity available in the peak periods of times, such as in the middle of July or August when it's 110 degrees, or last January when our usage here in Northern Illinois went up 30% higher than norm because heaters were running so much. That is, a, it's called capacity. It's regulated by the ICC, it's actually bid out. And strangely, it moves in very large chunks, in, in very large instruments. And so it's gonna be high for year one, it's gonna be high for year two, and it drops off in year three, which is why when you look at these rates, three years is a sweet spot. So that's part of it, and the other part of it is, unfortunately, just the power market has moved up um, about 10%, 15% a year since we've done our last bid. So combination of two, it's the market moving up and it's the, uh, uh, and it's this regulated charge which everybody will pay. Okay, and then next, uh, the dis you described a situation where people can just change. To me, that's just setting everyone up to be a target for tele telemarketers to come in and try and get them to change. I mean, is that kind of what's gonna happen is that everyone's now a sitting duck to get these phone calls and these robo calls to try and get them to, switch over well unfortunately that's happening now yeah anyway and I and that's that's the free market and nobody can do anything about that uh, it's just part of the you know my fit my my 
halfway comedic line is, now I know where all the people who 25 years ago when I used to sit down for dinner at six o'clock called me to switch long distance carrier. I don't know where they've been for the last 22 years, but now I know where they've right. surfaced again because now they're out knocking on doors and calling. They're over here. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. Did, 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 is it safe to say, Dave, that we could tell our constituents more of these calls that there is no way they can get a better rate for electricity not transmission yeah but the situation is hard for me to understand yeah if you're talking about buying from commonwealth edison actually they're just driving the milk trucks that's not right farmer right? that's right yeah that's just it, the combat rate is a pass-through rate it's not from so it's safe for us to tell our residents that ignore these calls that there's no way they're going to get a better deal than what we can arrange for them through aggregation? Um, it is safe to say, first of all, that the aggregating supplier that you all work with will never come to their door and will never call them. So, so it's safe to say that anybody who's calling them on the phone or knocking on the door is not going to be part of the village program. So that's a, that's a distinction. Um, after that, I can't absolutely unilaterally say that there's never gonna be a program that's better than ours. I can say that I've never seen one. And because just the, the rates that aggregate, and that's why, I mean, the, the number of suppliers are dropping as we go to bid because I think they're starting to say, wow, the margins are so thin. I'll just, I'd rather hire telemarketers and get better margins on my deals. But I can't, I can't tell you, and you can't say that anyway. I presume somebody in the room may challenge you on that. But I could say you, you could say that it's highly unlikely that any, anybody knocking on the door or calling their phone would be able to have a rate better. And if they do, and if they do, have him call me, have him, have him call Mike, and have him call me, and I'll, I'll be glad to find out. In the past two years, I've been real comfortable saying 4.7 cents. Yeah. Ignore these people. They're, right. They're Bob's going to rob you. That's but correct. Now, this is. Well, yeah, I, I think that the, I think the, I think the merits of aggregation still hold true. I think they hold truer now than they ever will, and I think going forward they will too. I think our rates will be good. The comment rate is, you know, it's a published rate. Well, it's a published rate. Um, and we'll see what that comes out to be. So, if we rebid this, what are you anticipating will come back? You know, I would like to. You know, I, I would hope that the first energy rate uh, for three would be closer to the comet rate, or excuse me, the constellation rate. You know, I would. It, it would drop. It'll drop a little bit. It's not going to drop. You know, cents. Uh, but I hope that it would be able to get closer to seven, seven point zero. And if that's the case, then I. would I'd certainly recommend that. So there's some real attractive wind turbines for residences now. Um, our village code allows that, right? There you go. So what do we need tonight? Uh, I think. Motion by Semple, second by Sullivan to remove, take this to bid, and rebid this. Discussion? I have a question. Um, is it, I seem to recall the, when we did this the first time that there was a, somewhat of an art form on uh, when you went out to get bids. And so are we, is uh, by us limiting you, we have to sign this contract within so many days and all these rules behind it. Are we limiting our, uh, your efforts by waiting until two weeks from now to go to bid on a Monday? Um, no, I mean, I would like to say that I could react that quickly to the marketplace. We're looking at the three year rate is the, is the major rate here. And, um, and we can't move so quickly that two weeks wouldn't hurt you. And the three-year rate's not gonna move 
in a precipitous manner. Um, so it's not like it's going to dip to seven for a couple days and we'll miss that. Um, unfortunately not. It's just I'm hopeful that you know that we're, we had a I mean, well, the, the agency who's buying the power for ComEd, they have to go into the marketplace. And I think they're in the market right now um, buying, so, they're, so there possibly could be some swings in the market. And my hope is that we got everybody on a bad day. Um, but, I, you know, there's a technical consulting term for you, right? You know, we got the markets on a bad day. Um, so my only hope is that, uh, you know, at these rates, I don't think waiting hurts us. It hurts, and I think there's. I think the opportunity for better pricing is greater than the opportunity for, you know, higher pricing. That's just. So the market's balance. not happier on Wednesday than Friday. Well, I, you know, yeah. My only sense is that uh, perhaps there were, you know, too many buyers in the market mm -hmm. today, and um, you know, possibly next Monday will be, you know, two Mondays will be better. Uh, clerk, please call the roll. Simple? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Goss? Yes. Yes. Abernathy? Yes. Yes. Motion yes. carries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we may want to think about ways to start getting the word out to residents to maybe begin to expect the release of that information somehow because we want to think about that. It's going to be a big change. Read it right. The bills will check. The bills will go higher. So think about that. Well, the thing that's unusual in my view is that years ago there was a gap between dosing up and Little or no difference. The economics of that are I don't understand. What's going on in that regard? You can talk about the penny added on to a lot of our charge. Right. Why sudden is it coming? Difference. Differential. Yeah, that's a great question. Why was the gap so far when we started this, and now it's? Inverted. So there's an eight, yeah, that's a good question. So the agency that buys the power on behalf of Commonwealth Edison, state agency, um, in 2008, uh, we had done this for a couple of years, they, and there was a fair amount of price fluctuation going on in the market in, from year to year. So the agency decided to lock in some longer term rates, and the key was the key was price stability. By the way, back in 2008, rates were going up about 10 or 15 percent a year. So they locked in price stability. They locked in rates through 2013. Um, that was a great plan, except that about nine months later, we went into a recession with the financial markets seizing up. And when that happened in the recession, the market for rate supply and demand crashed. And so as a result, um, in hindsight only, you would say they locked in at the wrong time. Okay. So as a result, there was a big spread between our rates, what we did. So when we first went to bid, I think it was 35% savings. The first year, the second year is 20% savings. So now that those rates have rolled off, they're able to go into the marketplace and um, and buy much closer to what we've always been buying in the marketplace. Okay. Why is Commonwealth Edison still in business? <laughs> well, Commonwealth Edison will always be in business because Commonwealth Edison is just the wires company, and all they do is maintain the wires. So they're a monopoly. We need them. They're the only ones. Um, the question you're asking is, why is there a quote comment yeah, rate? They're living off their transmission. And 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 that's the state of Illinois' choice to have a fallback plan um, available to residents who don't want to be bothered with making a choice. <coughs> there's always a fallback plan. Unfortunately, that's complicating issues now. And part of this could be resolved if they would say, if they would take that option away, because you can't plan it. it it's, it's problematic, obviously, as you just found out tonight. It's problematic in the planning, since we never know what the rate is, and it's a moving target. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Anything else?
from the uh, anything else, Mr. Lebedo? No. Okay. Takes us to village attorney, Mr. Marino. Village clerk? Report? Okay. All right. All right, that takes us to, uh, we need a, we're going to go uh, recess into executive session at this point, and there is no, will there be action required at the end? No, and there won't be any action required after the executive session. So I need a motion to recess into executive session. Second. Motion by Voss, second by Kim. Discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Yes. Yes. 